Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Luke McDermott. I'm a sales engineer for Snowflake based in Perth, Western Australia. Uh, great to have you all with us. Um, so for today's session, uh, we're going to do the first of what we're calling our deep dive sessions, um, looking at different areas and aspects of the Snowflake platform. Um, so hopefully a lot of the people in the session today have uh, seen a little bit about Snowflake and potentially uh, attended one of our earlier uh, webinars. And so today's session, what I really wanted to drill into is what we do from an architecture perspective within Snowflake um, to facilitate really simplifying the data management process. And, and really that covers a couple of things around uh, the way that we can ingest and store data um, and then some of the smarts that are built into both our data and our services layer um, to facilitate a lot of the features and functionality that we have as a platform. And um, really with a view to show you how Snowflake can simplify what you potentially currently do from a, a DBA and data management perspective. Um, as with all of our sessions, um, we have the team on standby who are available to answer any questions that you might have. Um, and as always, please ask your questions throughout the session um, so that we don't uh, have too many left towards the end. So just to quickly bring everybody up to speed, um, you know, from a Snowflake perspective, we are a cloud data warehouse. Um, and our big differentiator is the fact that we were built for cloud. Um, um, really, from a, a company perspective, there were three things that we were trying to achieve with the software. So first and foremost, yeah, we wanted to be a SQL data warehouse. Ultimately, we want people that have SQL skills, which you know covers the majority of organizations, um, to be able to run and administer the platform, um, to be able to get value out of it really quickly. Um, we're built for cloud, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, and we're delivered as a service. So a lot of the features and the functionality that we'll touch on today are really only possible because we're a SaaS solution. Um, and a lot of those smarts are then really baked well into our architecture. So from an architecture perspective, um, the way Snowflake came to be, there were two traditional database uh, architectures in the market. So your shared storage single cluster, um, think your SQL Server, uh, Oracle type databases. Um, you're very good from an OLTP perspective, um, potentially not particularly well geared for uh, more analytic type workloads. Um, and then we also had the shared nothing architecture. So you think your Nateza, Hadoop, Teradata, you know, the big MPP platforms, um, that gave a lot of capability for scale, but also have you know, significant overheads from a, a management perspective, both in terms of infrastructure and in terms of data. Um, so both of those architectures have their benefits and, and they have the things that become a little bit of a challenge. And um, what we've done from a Snowflake perspective is we've taken the best of both of those architectures um, to run what we call a multi-cluster shared data architecture. So um, we are technically an MPP uh, database and I will talk about what that means from a Snowflake perspective throughout this session today. Um, but we maintain a physical separation between our compute layer and our storage layer. And effectively, that gives us the ability to do you know, things like vertical and horizontal scaling in real time, um, and also the ability to scale without necessarily needing to maintain data in the background. So um, a couple of the themes that we'll keep touching on today, um, you don't need to manage data in Snowflake. So we don't have concepts of indexes, partitions. You don't need to vacuum data after you've reclustered it. You don't need to be striping across multiple nodes, et cetera. Um, a lot of the smarts that have been built into the, the Snowflake application um, really reside at the heart of this architecture. Um, and to drill into that a little bit further, um, we then have a third tier to our architecture. So we've got our storage layer, we've got our compute layer, and then we have our services. Um, and effectively, everything that you see and do from a Snowflake perspective generally will require an interaction with our services layer. So every time you fire a query, every time you ingest data, um, you know, Snowflake's constantly optimizing, it's gathering stats. Um, our services layer gives us the ability to be constantly highly available um, and gives us the ability to run across an entire uh, cloud region. Um, and it also stores all of the metadata within our application. Um, and we'll talk a lot about metadata in today's session um, because it's the linkage between the metadata in our services layer and the physical storage that we write into um, our cloud bucket. Uh, that gives us a lot of the flexibility and performance that uh, that we're able to achieve. Um, a couple of key things then from a Snowflake perspective, we are multi-cloud, so we're currently running on AWS and Azure, uh, and we are in preview at the moment for Google Cloud um, with an expect expectation that we'll be live a little bit later in the year. Um, and we are also global, so um, you can run Snowflake in uh, 
most countries and we've got a couple of local deployments here for AWS and Azure uh, locally in Australia uh, and also in Singapore. So for today's session, the first place that I wanted to start is in our storage layer. So if you think about our storage, uh, whether we're running on AWS or we're running on Azure, um, effectively our storage layer is S3 or Blob Store. Um, and there's a couple of things that we inherit as part of that um, that really underpin what we can do from an availability perspective. Yeah, S3 and Blob Store, um, highly resilient, highly durable uh, and immutable. Um, so from our perspective, it's the perfect location to, to keep the data that you bring into Snowflake. Uh, and the great thing from a, a customer's perspective is a lot of our customers that are currently on-premise are backing up to um, a combination of S3 or Blob Store. So uh, the place that a lot of customers feel confident putting their data, we natively inherit that as our storage layer. Um, and one of the key things then from a Snowflake perspective um, is we've got the ability to natively ingest any type of data, whether that's structured data or semi-structured. Um, and so from a, a flexibility perspective, um, it doesn't matter if you've got, say, weblog data or IoT sensor data that might be in JSON, XML, Avro, Parquet, Orc, one of these types of data, um, or whether you've just got your stock standard database data, you know, structured tables and rows. Um, from a Snowflake perspective, we're able to ingest that data, uh, we're able to compress it and store it, um, and we're also able to query it purely with SQL. Um, and one of the later deep dive sessions uh, that you'll see um, as part of this series will be how Snowflake can be used um, to really uh, perform a lot of the data lake functions that you're potentially looking at um, within your organisation because we've got that native ability to, to both consume and query either semi-structured or structured data. So from a, a logical perspective, before we dive too far under the hood, um, Snowflake as an application is relatively straightforward. And, and one of the great things about that, regardless of which platform you're potentially coming from in the database space, um, a lot of what you see and interact with in Snowflake will look very familiar to you. So we have the concept of an account. So an account is effectively your deployment within a region. Um, so if you're deployed on AWS or Azure, you'd have your own URL. And effectively within your account, you then can have one or more databases. Each of those databases can then have any combination of tables, views, materialized views, um, stored procedures, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of the, the common database objects that you're potentially familiar with, um, they exist in Snowflake and they'll look very similar. Um, now, one of the great things about our multi-cloud capability um, is we also have the ability for customers to run across multiple cloud deployments as well. So. Um, if you think about that from an account perspective, you know, technically we will have the ability to have another circle that sits above that, which would give you the ability to manage multiple accounts uh, in geographically different and potentially even um, vendor different clouds. So you might have a AWS deployment in Australia and you could potentially have a Azure deployment uh, over in the US. Um, and from a Snowflake perspective, we're gonna give you the capability to, to seamlessly replicate and move data between those deployments or using our compressed and encrypted data. So the, the simplest object to start with is obviously a table. So everything that you see from a data perspective in Snowflake will be stored in a table. Um, we'll talk a lot uh, as we go through today about what sits behind our tables. Um, but the important thing here is that when you're interacting with Snowflake, um, what you're interacting with will make complete sense to anybody that's ever seen the database before. So important both in terms of you know, defining your, your database schemas. Um, so all of our DDL, DML uh, and transactional SQL in Snowflake is uh, ANSI SQL compliant. Um, so it is gonna be very familiar. Um, but what you won't see when you're interacting with Snowflake is then all of the smarts that's built in between our services layer and then what sits behind the scenes. Um, so there's a lot of metadata that we gather throughout and you'll see there's an example here where as you're browsing through your database, we can give you some of those high level stats. Um, and then there's a lot more stats that we automatically gather in the background uh, that'll really start to underpin our performance. Um, and a lot of that is based around what we call a Snowflake FDN file, um, which is our, our uh, multi-partition, uh, sorry, micro-partition that sits in our S3 bucket. Uh, so from a, a storage perspective, whenever you ingest data into Snowflake, there's actually a lot that happens in the background. And so, and I'll, I'll go through and demo this in a second. Effectively, you ingest data into Snowflake using what we call our copy into command. And effectively what happens is as that data is ingested, um, we're actually reorganizing it into our proprietary FDN files. Um, we're optimizing them, we're compressing them, and we're storing them in a columnar format. Um, so one of the key things here is even though we're using these FDN files in our storage layer, 
uh, no one can ever get to our storage layer. So one of the important security measures that we have in place, the only way you can ever see data in Snowflake is through your services layer, um, and because that's where a lot of the decryption happens. Um, so even though we're storing those physical FDN files in our S3 or blob store bucket, you will need an account to be able to interpret that data. And that's one of the, the many security measures that we have in place. Um, and the important thing uh, from a management perspective is Snowflake's taking care of everything as part of that ingestion. So we're, we're organising that data, we're writing the files, we're building out a file structure to sit behind your table. Um, we achieve you know, really good rates of compression. So you know, we generally see at least four to six times compression. And one of the things we love to tell our customers is generally just storing in your data in Snowflake will make it cheaper. Um, but then two more important things that we do is we're constantly maintaining our metadata uh, and we gather statistics on every single DML operation that happens in the platform. So uh, you won't see a lot of the cumbersome DBA type activities you see in other platforms where you manually have to go and gather stats or you, you manually have to rebuild um, certain things in the background. Uh, Snowflake is constantly taking care of that uh, for you. Um, so when we actually get into our physical storage layer, effectively we've got lots of these FDM files sitting in our S3 or our uh, blob store bucket. Um, and effectively our micro partitions uh, directly link back to a table. So it gives us the ability to be constantly writing uh, compressed data into our uh, storage bucket. Um, and it gives us the ability to maintain the fine grained horizontal and vertical pruning, um, which gives us index like functionality without you as a customer ever actually having to build it. Um, and that's one of the really important points here. There's a lot built into um, the way that we both build our FDN files and the way that we gather the stats for those. Um, that means that Snowflake's automatically indexing itself. Um, so from a performance perspective, Generally, once you ingest data into Snowflake, it's already going to be performant based on the way that we're constantly gathering uh, those details. Um, and the other important uh, key attribute there is because we're writing into that S3 or blob store bucket, it's immutable. So um, we can't accidentally lose data out of S3 and blob store. Um, and the fact that it's immutable actually underpins a lot of the other features that we're actually going to talk about today as well. So including things like our time travel and zero copy cloning. Um, we rely on the immutability of our storage layer to achieve those types of functions. Um, so, again, really good balance between um, some smarts within Snowflake, but then also just leveraging the key features um, of cloud technology. Um, and so as part of writing those micro partitions, um, there's a few things that are actually happening. Um, and the most important one is Snowflake's uh, automatically gathering um, stats and metadata not just about the data that you're writing in, but also about those physical micro partitions that we're writing into the blob store. And effectively, that covers things like uh, table metadata, so the size of your table, both in terms of um, you know, bytes and rows, um, but also any references and table versions. And we'll talk about table versioning as we drill into our um, time travel capability. Um, but then also within our individual micro partitions themselves, we are also maintaining things like the range of values, um, the number of distinct values, and things like min maxes. Um, and effectively what that gives us is a zone map of your data. So from a Snowflake perspective, the reason you never actually have to go through a process to index your data is because every time a DML operation happens, Snowflake's automatically doing all of this work in the background. Um, there's a lot of platforms that talk about you know, it's simple to manage. The, the reality is from a Snowflake perspective, um, every time you ingest a record of data, all of these um, stat type operations happen automatically in the background. And as we go through and, and we demo, you'll see it's also super quick. Um, and effectively, we then split into two types of storage that we maintain. Um, so we mentioned we have a, a three-tier uh, architecture. So in our global services layer, um, we effectively maintain all of the stats of those FDN files. Um, which gives Snowflake the ability to do things like query optimization and pruning. So every time you write a query, when that query is requesting data out of our S3 or blob store bucket, it will use those stats and that metadata um, to effectively prune down to the individual files that it needs to return a, a value. Um, the other types of, of metadata that we maintain um, are things like versioning. Um, so when we talk about the, the time travel and zero copy cloning, that relies on our services layer constantly gathering the stats and maintaining a link for our metadata, um, which is effectively the reference to the physical file. So when we talk about a table in Snowflake, a table is a metadata object that will point to one or more uh, micro partition files. 
Um, and effectively, the, it's the metadata that really underpins a lot of what we can achieve from a performance perspective. So you know, we've got some of the best uh, database minds on the planet that have written our application. So things like query optimization are super effective. Uh, but the reality is the way that we're constantly uh, gathering and maintaining metadata for those physical files gives us the ability to, to constantly achieve a very high level of performance, um, including through DML operations as well. So if you need to run a big merge statement, Snowflake will actually use the metadata that's maintaining on all of those physical files to make sure that we are still using things like pruning um, to run that operation as efficiently as possible. Um, so, And then pruning is... is one of the, the key measures that we, we really use to, to achieve that level of performance. Um, and from a Snowflake perspective, we only ever want to scan and work with the specific files in our storage layer um, that are required to run a DML operation or respond to a query. So that's a, a very brief run through from a background perspective, what actually happens when you ingest data into Snowflake. So, I suppose what I wanted to do is just quickly show you what that looks from a user's perspective. So uh, in Snowflake, we'll set our context. Again, one of the great things with the Snowflake architecture, you can see how quickly uh, we can go through and we can create our compute node. So we have our context set. So what we're going to do is we're looking at a, a staging area. So this is just an S3 bucket that has lots of files written into uh, a bit of a data lake format. So if we wanted to query which of those files belong specifically to 2019, yeah, we can go through and do that. Um, just a couple of things on the ingestion side. So we can see the stats of those files. Uh, what's important here is we can actually see the MD5 value for that file. Um, one of the other brilliant things that our services layer will do is we'll keep a record of that MD5 hash. So when we ingest data out of that S3 bucket, um, Snowflake's actually got a reference in our services layer that will make sure that we don't re-ingest the same file using that MD5 hash value. Um, so it's one of the protections that we build in around the data loading process to make sure that we're not constantly duplicating data as we're ingesting it. So I mentioned before, the way that we get data into Snowflake is we run a simple command called copy into. So we're going to copy into our trips table from our trips bucket, uh, the 2019 subfolder. So as we run that operation, you'll see that that ticks away and we can see that we've loaded 5 million rows and we've loaded that in 4.29 seconds. Um, yeah, everybody that works at Snowflake loves to demo the platform. Uh, the reality is we get a brilliant level of performance. Um, one of the reasons we like this deep dive session, it's always good to cover in that 4.29 seconds, we've ingested the data from an external S3 bucket. Uh, we have compressed it. We have reorganized it into our Snowflake FDN micro partition files. Uh, we've physically written those to S3. And then we've also built a metadata layer in our services layer, which gives us all of the references and the pointers from our trips table into those physical files. Um, so if you think about the number of operations that are happening as part of that ingestion, uh, it really is incredible from a performance perspective that yeah, we can achieve all of that for 5 million rows of data in 4.2 seconds. The other thing that we've done from a, a data perspective is we've actually gathered the stats. So if I do a count star from our trips table, we can see that we've got those 5 million rows uh, returned. Um, interestingly, that is just a pure metadata operation. So because Snowflake will be gathering the stats on those DML operations, um, we're effectively just querying our services layer at this point. We don't actually need to hit the data to do that count. But importantly, from a a user's perspective, once we've ingested the data, is just a simple table and row. Uh, but what you don't see here in the background, each one of these uh, columns and rows is effectively pointing to one of those physical files sitting in our S3 bucket. So it's a combination of that metadata in our services layer and the way that we're actually physically writing that data into our S3 or blob store bucket that gives us that combination of performance. And the great thing is that actually gives us the ability to run you know, relatively complex queries instantly without any further tuning on that data whatsoever. So I've written a query here, uh, which is looking at a uh, number of trips that have been taken. It's looking at some different aggregations, um, duration, time calculations. Um, and you can see that query is run in one second. So from a performance perspective, we don't need to do anything uh, to tune it. 
um, basically once we ingest data, uh, it is ready and available for users to start querying it. Um, from a Snowflake side, you know, really that's the value that we're looking to offer our customers. Um, you know, we want a platform that is as simple to maintain as possible. Uh, and all of the smarts and all of the, the clever features that have been built in the background to facilitate that are there at your disposal as part of our SaaS architecture. So really your job uh, as a customer is just to think about how are we going to get data in and how are we going to get data out. Um, and just to, to show you what that actually looks like behind the scenes, we can actually use Snowflake to look at uh, some of the details around our metadata. So you can see here, we're actually able to count the partitions that have been created by our trips table. So Snowflake's got a really uh, interesting way of actually giving you the ability to use SQL to get an understanding of physically what's happening in that S3 bucket. So when we ingested that 5 million rows, we actually wrote 16 uh, micro partitions and we can actually see some details about those micro partitions. We've got a, a whole set of metadata operations, um, which I'd encourage you to have a look at. There are some interesting ways that you can use and interpret that data um, to get an understanding of how the platform is actually working. And you can see here, we're basically showing the number of rows that have been written into each of those uh, micro partition files. Um, we're not going to cover it too much today, uh, but you can actually use uh, some of the partitioning information um, to have a think about performance as well. Uh, so we do have a feature in Snowflake uh, called Auto Cluster, um, which effectively gives you the ability to control the way that Snowflake writes these physical files. Um, and you can actually use some of the stats that Snowflake's constantly maintaining um, to get a view of how well will a query perform based on the way that data is striped across those partitions. Um, so we won't cover that in too much depth today. Um, but there's definitely a lot of value in having a think about the way that data gets written and how you can use that to, to potentially think about optimizing performance. So from a, a storage perspective, basically we've talked through that concept where we have a table which sits in our services layer. Our table is effectively just a metadata representation of physical objects that are sitting in our S3. Um, one of the great features that falls out of that architecture is uh, something that we call a zero copy clone. Um, so effectively what a zero copy clone uh, does is it gives you the ability to clone a table, a schema, uh, or even an entire database, um, and effectively clone it in a way where you don't physically have to write any additional storage um, and clone purely in terms of a metadata operation. Um, so the, the great thing that that allows you to do is effectively you could do a prod to dev refresh and you can do it in seconds. Because Snowflake's not physically having to re rewrite files, um, a zero copy clone will create a new metadata view of that object. Um, and effectively, once a clone's run, you'll have two separate uh, objects, whether they be table schemas, databases, uh, pointing to the same set of physical, uh, physical files. Uh, and then Snowflake's effectively got the smart to then start managing deltas. Um, so if we were going to visualize that, this will make it a little bit easier to, to kind of see what's happening. If we think about in this diagram, we've got a table which is sitting in our services layer. Our table is called A1. And effectively, that table is pointing to four micro partitions that sit in our storage layer. If we wanted to do a zero copy clone, effectively what that gives us the ability to do is create a copy of our table A1, which would now become A2. And at the point that the uh, the clone first gets executed, um, effectively those two objects are both pointing to the same set of files. So even though we've effectively copied an entire database, um, we're actually still only sharing and using one set of physical files. Um, so we haven't created any additional storage. So from, a, from your perspective, it's effectively a free operation. Um, but from a user's perspective, they are two completely isolated databases. So we can query and interact with them completely separately. Uh, and then Snowflake's got the smarts built into it that as soon as a DML operation happens on either side of that clone, so in this example, we've uh, made a change to our A2 table. Effectively, what that's done, it's stopped linking to that partition and it's actually gone and created a new one. And effectively, what you'll see is Snowflake's actually maintaining deltas in our data across both of those tables. So we're only ever creating the physical storage that we need um, to be able to fill that operation. Um, but from your perspective, you've effectively got two physically separate databases that you could be using for, for completely different use cases. Um, and some, some great ways that our, our zero copy clones get used. I mentioned the concept of a, a prod to dev refresh. 
um, super quick way to make development uh, production data available in devs. Um, it's also a really good way to do a backup. So our zero copy clones are fully auditable. Um, and as long as you're not you know, modifying or deleting your historic data, um, effectively you can be using zero copy clones to create a series of free backups. Um, super efficient and effectively you know, free from a both a storage and a compute perspective. Um, so to give you a bit of a feel for, for what that clone operation looks like, um, we'll, we'll go through a couple of examples here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a clone of my CityWrite database to create a CityWrite dev database. So I'll run that operation. I can see it's only taken a few seconds. And if I refresh my metadata over here, you can see that we've actually got now two physically separate uh, databases. So what's interesting is we can see our trips table at the moment has got 100 meg of data in it. If I look into our CityWrite database, that 100 meg of storage uh, is effectively the same storage that's being shared across those databases. So at this point, we haven't physically written any additional storage into our S3. Um, so effectively, we've got our development environment. It's fresh with production data, uh, but we haven't paid any more money at this point to get there. Um, and because we're not writing that additional storage, uh, it's super cheap. So what I'm going to do here is just use an example of, of Snowflake scaling. So we're going to scale our warehouse up, and we're going to load the rest of our TRIPS files uh, into our TRIPS table. So if you recall, we had only loaded our 2019 data. And we can see, again, really good illustration of performance from a Snowflake perspective, you know, 0.1 of a second to scale up. Nine seconds, and we've ingested 71 million rows in this example, and then 0.2 of a second to scale it back down to a small. Uh, and again, if you think about the fact that we have that per second billing capability, um, it gives you that linear scaling, and effectively we're paying the same amount for that operation. So if I do a count of that table, we can see that our trips table now has got 76 million rows. Um, and so what we can do here is actually compare our trips table in prod to our trips table in dev. So if we do a count star from both of those tables, what you'll see is our production table has got 76 million rows. Our development table has only got 5 million rows. Because we haven't physically altered those files, um, those 5 million rows and that storage will actually still be getting shared with our production data. So whether that is a development operation or whether we're doing that from a backup perspective, those 5 million rows, um, we haven't physically created any additional storage to keep them. We've used that zero copy clone and the smarts built into our services and our metadata layer to effectively retain that data um, and keep it available. And so we can now effectively do anything that we like on either side um, of our clone. And effectively, we're protected from, from breaking another environment. Um, one of the, the areas that people do get concerned when we drill into this level of detail is, um, you know, what if I accidentally break a partition from the source of the clone or from the, the target of the clone? Um, the important thing to remember, and you will never have the ability to break either side. So effectively, they just become two separate databases. Snowflake will need do what it needs to do in the background. Um, to effectively give you that level of control and, and maintenance over it. So you don't really need to worry about you know, the potential to get in and, and accidentally break something. Um, so we've gone in, we've deleted a number of rows. So again, if I do our count, so even after our delete statement, our production table, we've deleted 50 million rows. Um, again, we still haven't deleted or changed anything in our, our clone environment. Um, and this is the way that zero copy clone you know, gives you that flexibility. Um, it gives you the ability to isolate those environments but not physically pay for any additional storage because in the background we've got that separation between our metadata in our services layer and our physical files which are sitting in our S3 bucket. So the last feature that I'm going to talk about uh, around our storage uh, is what we call our time travel. So in Snowflake, yeah, first and foremost, we understand the importance and uh, you know, the, the resilience that's required to house people's data in the cloud. Um, and we have built in a, a number of ways that we you know, protect customers from any issues around you know, things like data corruption, data loss. Um, 
So the first way that we do that is we effectively synchronise our data across an entire uh, cloud deployment. So because we're using that S3 uh, or blob store bucket, um, we leverage that uh, that resiliency in the cloud to make sure that we're running across uh, availability zones within the deployment. So if anything happened within one availability zone, Snowflake will seamlessly be running uh, against the other zones uh, in a deployment. Um, so that gives you a level of protection from any issues that potentially happen um, from a, a cloud infrastructure perspective. Um, the next way that we protect your, your data is what we call time travel, and I'll drill into this in a little bit more detail, um, but effectively it gives you the ability to look at your data at any point in time up to a period of 90 days ago. Um, so important in the sense that all with SQL operations and all within a single platform, you can do down to an individual row level restore um, purely using SQL operations without ever physically having to go to any kind of backup concepts. Um, so a lot of flexibility uh, and, again, a lot of features and functionality that's just built into our architecture that, that's just automatically available by signing onto Snowflake. Um, so time, protect, time travel will give you that protection you know, for that period of, of 90 days. Um, above and beyond that, we then have a, um, a number of ways that we can help for long-term data protection. Um, so we've already talked about zero copy clones. So effectively, a zero copy clone will last as long as you want it to, um, and it will be fully auditable. So once you create a, a zero copy clone, for all intents and purposes, that is a database backup. Um, gives you a point in time that you can go and restore from, and like we mentioned, may not have actually physically created any additional files. Um, so potentially could be something that you're doing constantly over time for little to no cost. Um, the other option uh, that we give our customers is you've always got the ability to unload data back out of Snowflake uh, and to write into a, a separate you know, cloud bucket or potentially download it if need be. Um, so in the same way that we can copy data into Snowflake and ingest it, we can unload data out of Snowflake um, and we can write out to a, a, a number of data formats depending on, you know, from a customer's perspective, really what you're looking to do. So. The, the key feature that we're going to look at here um, is the concept of uh, time travel. So if you think about in a standard database environment, your data is constantly changing. So every DML operation that runs, whether that is through a, a batch ETL process or whether you're using our types and stream features to do uh, more constant transformations within your warehouse, uh, the reality is every time a DML or DDL operation happens, there's going to be a level of change in your data. Um, and the more frequent that changes, the harder it is uh, to do things like backup and restore. Um, and also, you know, for anyone that is still currently on premise, generally the concept of a backup and restore you know, still inv involves going to external storage, um, doing a physical restore, potentially tape backups. Um, it's a really slow and cumbersome process and generally something that requires you know, not just DBA type input, but actually input from maybe an infrastructure team or somebody else. Effectively, what we do from a time travel perspective in Snowflake is we use those same principles that we talked about with our metadata and our physical files getting written into Snowflake. Because we're constantly gaining those stats and, and maintaining that metadata in our services layer, Snowflake can give you the ability to query any table as at any point in time for a period of 90 days ago. Um, and I'll talk through a couple of use cases um, around ways that you can make that work. But effectively, it gives you the ability to query uh, all of the rows within a table um, at that point in time with things like a where clause and, and all the other good stuff that you might do if you wanted to do a specific type of analysis. Uh, one of the key things with our time travel uh, is it is available in our enterprise edition or higher. Um, so just keep that in mind uh, as part of your decision-making process when moving ahead with Snowflake. So... Like I said, basically the principle of time travel is that we give you the ability to, to look back in time and query data as at a point in time. So some uh, typical types of DDL and DML operations that we've captured here. So the ways that you organise your data, um, generally with things like create statements. Uh, from a Snowflake perspective, we can insert or we can copy da into data. Um, and then what you'll see here, this blue box in the middle, we talk about the ability to query data. So Generally, if you think about SQL, you can do a select star from a table. Um, one of the, the things that our time travel gives us the ability to do is use clauses like at or before. So select star from a table at five o'clock yesterday because our ETL broke last night and it corrupted our table. Um, 
that's automatically built in. And the great thing that that gives us the ability to do is not just run a select, um, but you'll also see that we can also create table, create schema, create database using those uh, um, objects as at that point in time. So effectively, we can restore an entire table, an entire schema, or an entire database um, using that same concept and querying that database as at that point in time. And my favourite feature of all with time travel, um, yeah, typical example, somebody accidentally drops a table in production because they thought they might have been doing a dev type operation. Um, we have a feature in Snowflake called undrop. So effectively using that same concept, um, we can undrop an object and effectively automatically bring it back without any concept of a physical restore of data. Um, there's a, a lot of different ways that you can use uh, time travel. Uh, generally, one of the things I hate telling customers is to go and look at our documentation. This is definitely an example of where I would encourage you to do some reading. Um, we do hear a lot of anecdotes for customers early in their journey that, um, oh, we went through a really complicated backup and restore process. And it's like, well, you don't actually need to. Um, pretty much everything you'd be looking to do from a restore perspective um, should just be ready, readily available at your fingertips. Um, there's some examples here of how we can use concepts like show me a table as at a point in time, um, show me a table five minutes ago, um, or show me a table before a specific query was executed. And that's a good example of we might want to see what a table looked like before somebody ran a big update statement or a big delete statement. Um, because our query IDs in Snowflake are unique, you can effectively look the query ID up and use that as a way to go back and do a restore. Um, and similarly, on um, the, the concept of a, a drop and undrop, um, the drop operation effectively only drops the metadata in Snowflake. It doesn't physically drop our, our storage out of our S3 or blob store bucket. And again, the main reason for that is that our storage is immutable. So that operation won't happen at the same time. And um, the great thing from your perspective, if you accidentally uh, drop an object, you know, in Snowflake, we've got that simple command to do an undrop, and that'll automatically restore that object with that link back to those physical uh, micropartition files sitting in our, our blob store. So we'll talk through a, a couple of examples here uh, around that time travel concept. So if we do a, a count star on that object, we can see that we've got those 24 million rows. If we drop that table and we try and do a count star, we can see that that object doesn't exist. So in the world that I came from, that tended to be a problem. Uh, lots of emails, lots of calls, lots of angry people. In Snowflake, from our perspective, it is a simple concept of doing an undrop. And then if I do a, a select count star from that table, um, we can see that that result has come back. Um, so that's a really simple example um, of a way that we can uh, do that concept of a drop and undrop. Um, now, what we'll do here is we'll go back and we'll insert some more data and we'll show you the concept of a uh, row level restore in Snowflake. Um, So what we're going to do is we're going to just delete all of the data out of our table. So I'm going to write a very simple delete statement. We can see that we've deleted those 24 million rows. And so if we do a select count star from that table now, you can see that we've got nothing in it. So from a Snowflake perspective, what we really want to do is say, let's isolate the query that caused that data to be dropped. And so we looked at a couple of ways that we can query our query history. This is another example where we can actually say, show me the last query that started with the word delete. So a really simple way of looking that, uh, that object up. We've written that into a session variable. And what we can see is we can actually query the same trips table at two different points in time using our time travel. So really simple operation here. So we're doing a count star from our trips table, which is our current state, and that is our zero rows. We can do a count star from our trips table before the statement that ran against the table was that query ID. 
So we can see before we deleted all the rows, we had 24 million rows of data there, and we can see that we've now got zero. Um, now, there's a, a plethora of ways that we can look to do or restore in Snowflake, but this um, is one of my favourite ways because it pretty much uses only metadata operations. So we'll talk through each of them as we go. Um, so we have the concept here of using a zero copy clone. So what we're going to do, we're going to a table called trips alt, which is going to be a clone of our trips table before we run that statement. So effectively, a zero copy clone, um, we don't just run those over current data. We can also use a zero copy clone of a data set at a point in time. And again, because that's just a metadata operation, it's super quick. So 0 0.5, 0 0.5 of a second, um, we've effectively restored that data into a new table called Tripsol. If we do a quick select style, effectively we can see that those columns and rows have been brought back now. Um, and instead of writing that data back to our original Trips table, um, we can use a different command here. And again, this is another illustration of some of the really neat features that we have built into our, our services and our metadata layer. So we're going to alter our table trips and we're going to swap with our trips alt. So if we've got two identically structured tables, we can effectively swap between them. We can drop our alternate table and our data set's been restored. So really, really simple example of a, a couple of different ways that we can um, use our time travel. Um, and also a really neat way that we can actually combine time travel with a zero copy clone to do a backup and restore as at a point in time without physically creating any additional data. The other great thing about our time travel and our cloning is there's zero downtime. So you, as a customer, you don't need to be worried that you need to schedule backups to happen at certain times of the day. You don't need to be worried about things like contention because they're, they're big, beefy operations. Um, the reality is we can do all of those operations in real time because it's all governed and managed entirely through the, the Snowflake services layer. So uh, I suppose just to summarise a couple of those points, effectively we talked about the global services layer um, a lot through this session. Um, when you think about the services, most people probably think about the interface, which is obviously a big part of our services layer. Uh, but the reality is every time you connect into Snowflake, whether that's through the UI or whether that's through an EELT tool, a BI tool, a, a data science platform, um, effectively all of that activity gets managed and orchestrated through our services layer, which also then handles things like um, security. Um, it manages our compute layer. Um, it has all of the smarts built in to ma handle and manage our, our query optimization. So like I, manage, like I mentioned before, our services layer will take care of things like pruning um, and it'll make sure that every query that runs in Snowflake is as efficient as possible. Um, because it's got all of those indexing-like concepts already built into it through every DML operation. Um, and then those last two are then really important. All of our metadata um, and some of the smart ways that we cache within Snowflake um, are all captured within that services layer as well. Um, the last point that I wanted to, to quickly touch on is just a bit more detail around caching itself. So there's a few ways that we, we cache within Snowflake, uh, again, purely with the view that we want to make the platform as quickly as possible. So all of the metadata uh, that we've talked about through this session, you know, your tables, your columns, your reference pointers to those micro partitions, um, that gets cached in our, uh, our services layer uh, to make sure that things like query optimization and planning are as quick as humanly possible. Um, we also cache data through um, the querying process as well. So every time you run a query in Snowflake, uh, our compute layer will be processing those micro partitions into result sets. Um, each time a micro partition gets um, processed as part of the query, we'll actually cache it on that compute node. Um, again, just means the longer that you're querying on a compute node, the faster and faster it's going to get. Um, the great thing with the way that Snowflake works on the caching side of it is if you've got data that's changing, um, the Snowflake will be automatically invalidating that cache. So you never need to worry about um, isolated compute nodes returning different results uh, down to caching. Snowflake, because of our SaaS architecture, is managing that for you. So again, uh, we'll cache when we can and we'll make things a lot quicker. And then finally, uh, we'll also cache a result set uh, into our services layer as well. And our, I think our results will last for 24 hours. Uh, but effectively means if you have two people in your company run the exact same SQL statement, so it might be a, 
a specific report or query that gets generated by a BR tool. Um, if that query has already been executed, Snowflake will actually refresh the results out of our services layer. So it won't require any compute at all. Um, to the point where if you haven't got compute running, it won't actually turn compute on to process the query. So incredibly powerful. And again, just one of the, one of the additional ways that we use our services layer to really kind of boost and, and generate uh, performance through the platform. Um, so finally, I suppose just to summarize the things that we've, we've talked about here, you know, this was a, a bit of a deep dive technical uh, session covering the way that Snowflake ingests and manages data and metadata. Um, and I suppose from our perspective, yeah, we think we love talking about it because there's a lot of great stuff that happens under the hood. It, the, the reality is from a customer's perspective, um, it's great to understand that this is what Snowflake can do in the background. But the key takeaway from the session today, all of the, the cumbersome DBA type operations that you're used to um, with a platform that you're probably working on right now, you don't need to do in Snowflake. So you don't need to think about things like optimization and tuning. Um, you never need to manage your data. So we don't have table spaces. You don't have the concept of a disk. You, you never manage storage in Snowflake. Uh, and you also don't actually have to worry about how that data is getting written. So we don't have those concepts of like indexes and partitioning that you might see in an OLTP platform. You don't have distribution keys and vacuuming that you'd have in a, a legacy MPP platform. All of those concepts happen in real time, managed by our Snowflake uh, services and storage layer. Um, and then I suppose underpinning all of that is then that concept of, of time travel. So you don't need to, ha to be running manual backups. You don't necessarily need to be exporting data out of Snowflake. And um, because we're using that S3 and blob store layer, we're automatically highly available uh, and we've got a really resilient data layer. Um, so our zero copy clones are fully auditable and effectively they're free. Um, and ultimately, we want to give you, the customer, the power to focus on the things that actually matter in your data platform, which we would say, you know, getting more data in um, and, and getting more reporting and analytic output. Um, and the less time you have to spend actually maintaining the platform, the more time you've really got to, to focus on those value add tasks. And finally, the, the area that we always finish for these sessions, um, we talk a lot about performance at Snowflake, both from a compute perspective and then you know, a bit more of a deep dive here into our, our physical architecture. Uh, one of the things we always tell people is try the platform. So as, as much as we love to talk about it, you'll get such a great sense of, of how Snowflake works and what value it can offer um, by using our free trial. Uh, so it's available on our website. Um, you get $400 of credit, which will generally last you quite a long time. Uh, and it will give you the ability to experiment and go through a couple of the concepts that you've seen here today. Um, and as always, um, please reach out to our team if you've got any questions or you want to deep dive into any of this detail um, yeah, at a bit more of a lower level. So thanks uh, to everybody for joining the session today. I hope you uh, got some value out of it. Um, if you do have any questions left, I think we've still got um, another 10 minutes or so. So please feel free to, to jump on and, and post any additional questions. Um, but thanks for joining us, and yeah, uh, hope you guys got a lot out of it. Thanks a lot.